Every 20 seconds, someone in the United States is hospitalized with sepsis. And sometimes that infection doesn't hit your lungs or your kidneys. It can hit your spine. September is Sepsis Awareness Month. And did you know that back pain in people who inject drugs could actually be a sign of a life-threatening infection? Today, we're breaking down a real case, a 45-year-old male who was an IV drug user who came in with severe debilitating back pain, and it turned out to be discitis with an epidural abscess caused by MRSA. So let's talk about how sepsis could actually eat away at your spine. What is sepsis? Sepsis is what happens when your body's natural defense system, your immune system, goes into overdrive while it's fighting an infection. So instead of attacking the bacteria or the virus, your immune response spreads everywhere, causing massive inflammation. Now, I want you to think of it like a house fire. Normally, a fire department will come out and put out the fire that's in one room. But in sepsis, the sprinklers go off in every single room and every house and floods the entire home. The result, damage to your body's own organs, your heart, your lungs, your kidneys, and even your brain. That's why sepsis is so dangerous. It's not the infection, but it's your body's response to it. And if it isn't caught quickly, it can lead to shock, organ failure, and even death. There is 350,000 deaths per year in the United States alone due to sepsis, and any infection can cause it. Pneumonia, urinary tract infection, and even a bloodstream infection that seeds your spine. What is discitis, and how can bacteria actually get inside of your spine? Discitis is infection in the cushion between the bones in your lower back called the intervertebral disc. Now, normally this disc acts as a shock absorber to your spine, so you can bend and move without pain. But if bacteria gets inside of this disc from the bloodstream, let's say from an infection on your skin, your lungs, or even using IV drugs, it can get inside of this disc and cause a massive infection and cause debilitating pain. Well, how does the bacteria get inside of the disc? It can happen for a multitude of risk factors anything that can potentially cause bacteria to get in your bloodstream and thrive. Those risk factors include IV drug use, diabetes, immunosuppression, like people that are on steroid medications or undergoing chemotherapy. In the U.S., the incidence is one in every 100,000, but is rising with the opioid epidemic. And the mortality rate is up to 20%. So how does this happen? You see, bacteria can get inside of your bloodstream from a multitude of reasons. If you have a cut, a scrape, or an abscess or a boil, bacteria can get in through your skin and get inside of your blood. Or if you use non-sterile needles, like using IV drugs, that bacteria can get directly into your veins from the needle. In fact, dirty or reused needles is the most common risk factor for MRSA bacteremia. Other types of medical devices can cause bacteria to get in your bloodstream like central lines, dialysis catheters, IVs, or even urinary catheters can serve as an entry point for MRSA. Prosthetic joints like knee replacements, heart valves, or other implants can get seeded with staph. Even if you have a bad pneumonia, the bacteria can get from your lungs and spread into your bloodstream. And here's the problem. Your disc in your spine doesn't really have a great blood supply. So that means your immune system and antibiotics have a hard time getting in there. So if the bacteria is floating around in your bloodstream and finds itself landing inside of your disc, your body has a really hard time trying to fight back and the infection can get really bad really fast and I've seen it happen. What happens is the abscess gets inside of your disc and then it starts to spread into the nearby bone called osteomyelitis. And the result is severe debilitating back pain, fevers, and in bad cases, it can actually spread out into the epidural space and impinge upon the nerves of your spinal cord. This can cause weakness, numbness, and even paralysis if it's not treated quickly. The most common organism is MRSA, and if it's untreated, it can lead to osteomyelitis and potentially epidural abscess, like in the case of our patient. Here you can see that his infection is in the L5-S1 disc, and then the pus is spread out into the spinal canal, causing this epidural abscess that's compressing on his nerve roots, causing the leg pain. How do we make the diagnosis? I'll tell you, the pain is often way out of proportion to what is typically seen in patients with lower back pain. 
The pain typically begins all of a sudden and it is screaming, raging pain with any type of movements. And the symptoms are usually accompanied by fevers, chills, and even neurological changes like numbness or weakness. And the red flags that you need to keep an eye on are patients with back pain, fever, and a history of IV drug use. That is discitis until proven otherwise. And you just don't see it only in IV drug users. You can see it in patients with chronic kidney disease, immunosuppression, or diabetes. So if you see fever accompanied with back pain, be on the lookout. Labs that you can order is a white blood cell count, ESR and CRP. Those are almost always elevated. And the MRI is the gold standard. The first laboratory study that you want to do is something called blood cultures, where you obtain a culture from the blood so you can see if there's bacteria in the bloodstream. How do you treat a discitis? It really depends on how severe the infection is. Treatment can range from starting IV antibiotics to sending the patient down to interventional radiology to get an aspirate and culture, or in some cases, this can be a neurosurgical emergency. Depending on how sick the patient is, sometimes we start empiric antibiotics to begin treatment. Now, I usually tell my consultants, it's best to talk with neurosurgery as soon as you find out the patient has discitis to determine the next steps of treatment. The most important thing about discitis is knowing what bacteria is inside of that disc and what antibiotics we can use to treat it. And that means obtaining appropriate cultures are incredibly important in this patient's treatment plan. In our patient's case, he had an epidural abscess causing rapid progression of neurological symptoms and he needed emergency surgery so we could evacuate the abscess and decompress the nerves in his spine. And at the same time, we were able to achieve cultures so we can obtain the correct antibiotics to treat him. Now the type of surgical treatment really depends on what's going on in the patient's spine. Sometimes it's simple debridement and epidural abscess evacuation. And sometimes the patient may need stabilization such as fusion procedure where we implant hardware. But in absolutely every single patient with an infection of their spine, they will need long course of IV antibiotics, typically six to eight weeks. And I want to make sure that all healthcare providers understand how painful this condition is because we have to treat the patient's pain appropriately. Our patient that I presented yesterday underwent a hemilaminectomy for evacuation and debridement of the epidural abscess and was immediately started on IV antibiotics for treatment of his MRSA infection. He did great and after eight weeks of IV treatment, he was successfully cured of his infection. I'm happy to say he also got into rehab for his addiction and has been clean for two years. I wanna stress how incredibly important early recognition of sepsis is in making this diagnosis. So if you have a patient that has severe back pain plus fever, especially with these risk factors, keep this diagnosis on the top of your list because sepsis could potentially be hiding inside of the spine. Remember guys, September is Sepsis Awareness Month. Please make sure to share this video to spread awareness. It could potentially save a life. And if you know someone that has risk factors and develops fevers plus back pain, don't wait. Awareness is prevention. Another case of patient-focused and compassionate care. Stay tuned next week and I'll go through another case.